Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fish Trap's Big Read Finale. My name is Mike Midlow. I'm the program director here at Fish Trap. And the Big Read is an initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts and managed by Arts Midwest to broaden our understanding of the world, our communities, and ourselves through sharing a good book together. This year, we've been exploring In the Heart of the Sea, the tragedy of the whale ship Essex. And for our finale, we bring you the book's author, Nathaniel Philbrick, from his home on Nantucket Island. That's Nantucket Island is the same place where the ship Essex launched in 1819 on its fateful encounter with the whale. Before we get going, I want to thank all of our sponsors, Community Bank, Arts Center East, Oregon Arts Commission, and the Book Loft. Plus, all of the schools and libraries in Wallawa and Union counties who participated in the Big Read, and of course, all of you who joined in and read the book too. Our finale might be a, um, a Big Read first. This event is a special partnership between Fishtrap in Northeast Oregon and Middletown Public Library in New Jersey. Ha, huh, they're reading In the Heart of the Sea too. It's exciting times. I'll have more for you about that later. Okay. I want to introduce you to Fish Traps Executive Director, Shannon McNerney. She recently sat down with Nathaniel Philbrick virtually to talk about how he came to write in the heart of the sea and answer some questions submitted by students from Wallowa County, Oregon and Middletown, New Jersey. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, it means a lot to all of us. It means a lot to uh, both us and to the Middletown Public Library that you're joining us today. And I, you know, I think we just talked about it a few minutes ago, traveling to Wallowa County and in, in, uh, the winter is a little prohibitive. Um, and I'm sure your urge to leave beautiful Nantucket right now is not super <laughs> high. So I'm and just great, just grateful. So well, well for me, it's it's you know this has been a tough year for all of us, and this has been one of the few positives: the ability to travel uh, virtually and and talk to not only you but uh, the Middletown uh, all at once. It's just really really cool, and so uh, I really enjoy it. You're probably doing one of the very first bi-coastal big read events. So congratulations. And speaking of that, congratulations on the book being selected for the big read. What was your reaction to that? Well, you know, it's been around a while. I wrote this book, you know, I started writing this back in 1998. And, um, and to have it, you know, come back has been so much fun. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it came back around the time of, of uh, the centennial of of uh, the bison, yeah, the centennial, you know, the celebration of Herman Melville's birthday. And so it's been kind of, you know, a convergence of this story that inspired so much of Moby Dick, uh, Melville. And uh, for me, it's just been fun to uh, return to the book because, you know, I write these books and then I'm off to another one. And I, I really don't, you know, dwell on them. And this gave me the opportunity to return to it. And uh, it was a lot of fun. So speaking of Moby Dick, I did see that that one of your really intriguing collections was was a book about why why read Moby Dick. Yeah. So uh, lots of people have asked questions about Moby Dick, the questions that were submitted to us, and I'm curious about that. Why why read Moby Dick? Can you answer that in a in a <laughs> few sentences since you wrote a whole book about it? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, for me, uh, Moby Dick is my personal Bible. Uh, it it really? really is. I think it's the American Bible as it comes as close as anything to be a repository of what it is America is all about. You know, it's, you know, the workings of democracy, uh, racism, um, the dangers of, of dictatorship, you know, all of this is, is in there. And, uh, you know, it's not only the story of a whaling voyage, um, it's a story in which Melville packs what was happening at his in his day and age in 1850 into it. And that what was happening then was the build up to the Civil War. Uh, the fugitive slave law had just been passed. And so, you know, all of that sense of a society on the edge, the precarious edge of disaster is built into the novel. And so that whenever society feels like it's on the edge of a, a catastrophe and when is 
when are we not on the edge of a catastrophe? Uh, Moby Dick uh, has a renewed relevance. And so for me, it's just one of those essential books. And it was really the, um, the conduit through which I discovered the story of the Essex. You know, I, we moved to Nantucket in 1986, you know, more than 30 years ago. And I was not, I was an English major in college and uh, not a historian by any means, but Moby Dick was my favorite book. And so we moved and I was excited about moving to Nantucket. It's 30 miles off the coast of Massachusetts because it was the port of the Pequot. Uh, you know, it was where that, that incredible novel uh, sets out. And so um, uh, it was my love of Moby Dick that then led me into learning about Nantucket history and, uh, and sparking the, the love of history I've been following ever since. Do you, uh, now that you've been, you've been in Nantucket, you say for over 30 years, how well known is this story to locals? Or you, you also talked about a little bit in your book too, how many, you know, locals versus tourists, which we can relate to here in Malawi County somewhat, sure. but, but how, you know, how, how well known is that story and how much, how well is it talked about? Yeah, it's interesting because when In the Heart of the Sea came out, for many people, it was the unknown story of the Essex. Well, on Nantucket, um, it is very much a known story. You know, it's part of uh, the mythology almost of the island. Uh, you know, it's the story of the whale that that struck a ship and inspired Moby Dick. So it's, it's there, but, you know, it's not the kind of thing where we have um, Captain Pollard's or Owen Chase's great, great, great grandson to, to talk about their ancestors. But what we do have are the houses. You know, Owen Chase's house is still there. The house in which Captain Pollard was living um, uh, is, is still here and with a plaque on it. And so, you know, the, the evidence is here. It's a story that is, is really, you know, a part of the island in a way. And yet, you know, it's a funny, it's such a dark story um, uh, that particularly in the old days when whaling was still, uh, if not active, but you know, part of the collective memory, uh, it was a story people didn't like to talk about. There's a story of a young girl asking her, her aunt, you know, what is this about the Essex? And, and she says, you know, on Mary, on Nantucket, we do not talk about the Essex. And I think there's a little bit about that. You know, it's, it's kind of the tab taboo topic because it's, you know, it's Islanders um, uh, reduced to the worst extreme I, most of us can imagine. And, you know, it's not a, it, it, you can see it as a tale of triumph, but it's not really adventure. It's, it's, it's scary stuff. And um, uh, so it's a part of the island, but it's, you know, sort of in the shadow realm. It's interesting that you say that. I, I think about the times we're living in now too, that, that, you know, it's really truly a story about survival. It's a story about, you know, what doing the very base, you know, coming to the base nature of our, ourselves to do what we need to do to, to survive that story. But I'm curious about, you know, the, some of the ethical components that come up with, you know, some of the obvious things with, you know, the cannibalism and all the other issues. But to me, how does Nantucket um, still talk about its whaling history, because obviously the way we look at that has changed dramatically. Yes. You know, and it's changed since uh, I've been here. You know, when we um, came here back in the 80s, you know, yeah, there was the sale, save the whale movement, you know, was out there, but there was still, you know, a real pride in Nantucket's whaling heritage. And there still is, you know, it's, it's such a defining element of the island. But, um, you know, it's one of the reasons why I got interested in Nantucket history was I, 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 was, I, w I wasn't finding what I, uh, when I read books about Nantucket history, I was, it was almost like, you know, reverential about the Nantucket Quaker whalemen going out there and, and providing the world with light. And when I began researching what would become my first work of history, A Way Offshore, which is a history of Nantucket, I began to see, you know, uh, this was a this was an incredible place, but it was there were some dark sides to what was going on. Uh, the you know the Quakers were were pos did positive things in a lot of ways, particularly when it came to the abolitionist movement and all that. But they were also 
uh, brutal and very difficult um, uh, when it came to the, the whalers they hired. You know, th this was a very exploitational um, uh, environment. And so I began, you know, it be, it, for me, it was a chance to sort of see, see something that had, you know, it was in, in miniature what I think American history has, has gone through where, you know, in the, not too long ago, we looked to our past as, as an example to all the world and now we're beginning to see, wait a minute, you know, it, it wasn't all heroic march to, um, to liberty and justice. Uh, there, there have been some missteps along the way, and, and, um, and it's important that we look at those missteps and, and those uh, times when, you know, society tries to hide its darker side, because otherwise we really won't understand where we're headed uh, in the future. I think one of the challenges of this book in general is is the the way we look at the world as a black and white you know dichotomously there's good people and bad people and good things and bad things and I struggled with that myself I I remember telling my staff at one point when I finished the you know the when the the chapter where the whale, you know, the, the ship was stove by a whale. I actually wrote in the book, go whale. And I thought <laughs> that's probably not um, the best instinct of my nature, but I, it got me thinking about questions about empathy. Um, yep. How did you, what, I mean, again, you're going back several, you know, 20 plus years into research, but how do you feel about these people? How did you learn to empathize so you could tell their story? Yeah, um, well, you know, I've had readers say, you know, uh, they killed whales. How can I have any sympathy for them? And you know, and I say, well, look, if you grew up on Nantucket um, uh, in the early 19th century, uh, uh, you grew up in a world where uh, this was before petroleum. Um, uh, you know, you saw yourself providing the world with light. Um, you know, uh, there are slaughterhouses today where we, you know, we have no problem um killing animals um they saw the whale as essential to the improvement of society and you know um if you were a kid there was nothing else um you you either were going to go into some version of the whaling industry whether at sea or or on the island uh there really was no alternative and it, but if you know you were a middle school kid and you know you saw instead of going to high school you went on a whale ship and when you saw, you saw your friends head out, come back three, four years later, and they had literally seen the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, they were like the fighter pilots with the right stuff um, then. And so, you know, it, it was just was a different time. And I, th I think it's kind of historically naive um, if we expect the people of the past to live by the standards we've developed today. I mean, hey, I know in my, in my own life, if I look back um, to my youth, I know, I know I was guilty of behaviors that would not be tolerated today. And, you know, that's just what happens. A society evolves, hopefully in good directions. And, um, but I don't think that means the people of the past didn't try to live their life as best they could. You know, it, we, we, we're looking from the past, from the, you know, our, our present, we know where it's headed. Um, but people living at the moment don't know that. Um, right now, we are doing things that in 100 years, they're going to say, what the heck were they thinking? Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, it's often said, you know, you must know your history um, uh, so you don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I'm afraid that's not true. I mean, if all my work with history has, has made me, uh, if anything, uh, the only thing we can bring is humility because we are in the middle of life as we live it. We're doing our best, but we don't know where it's headed, and um, and so uh, the the you know you, I don't think I you can condemn people in the past. Um, uh, you have to. I think empathy is a very important characteristic, but I think it's also the duty of history to to pass judgment in a way while understanding as best we can the circumstances under which these people were living. Do you see an antagonist in this story? Ah, do I see an antagonist in this story? You know, it's funny, it's not Moby Dick. You know, there's no clear Ahab character. Um, uh, and I mean, what I, I really like, um, I, I, you know, I don't find life to be good and bad. You know, I find 
actually the life I'm living, I find all sorts of gradations and I find it hard sometimes to recognize evil when it is there. Um, and then many people have are good, bad. I mean, no one falls into these these black and white uh, categories. It's, you know, this is, life is like this. And, um, and, and you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I really, uh, in, when it comes to this story, what the character I really gravitate towards is Captain Palmer. Mm -hmm. um, he is kind of the Hamlet of this story, you know. Uh, he, he was not born to be a leader. Uh, he was born to be the perfect second in command. You know, he, he, uh, he had a, he was one invested, I think, with a great deal of human empathy, uh, could understand what others were going through, and was very good at communicating uh, those and understanding what those feelings, and, and, and could understand other people's point of view. And time and time again, and you see in the, the book where Pollard's first instincts are the right ones, but he allows himself to get pocked out of them because he has such a you know sympathy and empathy for other points of view, and the fact of the matter. But then there is Owen Chase. Um, you know he is the hard drive. He is the natural born leader. You know he is the one who is convinced his way is the right way. And the irony, of course, is time and time again, it's not necessarily the right way. And and ultimately, I think the story of the Essex is is a story of dysfunctional leadership, where you have this. This, the, this pairing of two people, uh, a second in command who is born to be a captain and a captain who is born to be a second in command. And you, so you see them go after each other and, and not necessarily bring out the best in each other, even though no one is intentionally doing anything evil here. Uh, they are just following uh, their, 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 you know, who they are. And that's, that's what I find fascinating. That's life. That's the you know. That's the way it is, and I think you know you can look at this as kind of in microcosm a, le a kind of lesson in leadership, uh, and and uh, because leaders, a born leader, M Melville and Moby Dick says you know you know all all um, all great men uh, you know is is nothing but disease in some way. You know the fact that you know all great leaders have a bit of the Ahab in them. And the important thing for a leader, I think, is to you know under, recognize their ambition, but channel that in a direction that is not completely self-serving. And um, and I and I think that's happening in the Essex. But it's for my money that is the fascinating thing to watch is how how you see Pollard and Chase navigating themselves and this unimaginable situation they find themselves in. Do you see a Pollard in a chase circumstance in our world right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, spot, but yeah. no, I listen, I resist the uh, trying to do parallels because it just doesn't work. Um, and I think it's almost dishonest to the past to, and yet we all do it uh, one way or another because we all see the past through the prism of our present. And that's why history needs to be rewritten because every generation looks at the past with a whole different set of concerns as, as um, America and the world uh, moves on. And, um, and so when it comes to, um, you know, yeah, you can see Chase as, as you know, the, the hard driving, um, uh, you know, I'm not, he's not an Ahab, but there's an aspect to him that is that way. And, um, and you can see Pollard as kind of the Starbuck, uh, we, who is the, the second, the first mate in Moby Dick, who, you know, doesn't really have the gumption to stand up to, to Ahab and yet recognizes uh, and is, you know, recognizes his inherent evil. And in a way, that's what's going on on the Essex, except the positions are reversed in terms of chain of command. And, um, you know, and I think that's one of the things Melville does. The, the story of the Essex was, was absolutely essential to Melville's process in this. I mean, this was a story he uh, read and learned about as a young whaleman um, and then returned to, got his own copy of Owen Chase's narrative of the Essex while he was working on Moby Dick 
And so, you know, this was something that he had uh, had internalized as much as the Shakespeare and Milton he was reading, uh, the Bible, the King James version of the Bible. It's all in there. And and so, what I found within the heart of the sea was I needed to get a distance from Melville. You know, I need. Yeah, you know, he has such a huge literary shadow that I'm, uh, as soon as I, I began working on In the Heart of the Sea, I said, I cannot look at Moby Dick. <laughs> um, I need to write this book um, without that. And then once I read, finished the first draft, I then returned to Moby Dick. But I just didn't, you know, one of the challenges I have as a writer is, um, as a writer of nonfiction of history, is, you know, a lot of the, the, the evidence I use is not the most literary, you know, it's kind of boring stuff. It's newspaper accounts, it's journals, it's, you know, things like that. And so, uh, but I think it's essential in telling a story to have a voice, um, to, to have a voice that, that, you know, translates the, the mundane facts of the evidence into something that hopefully um, captures a reader's attention. And, and I didn't want that to be Melville's voice. And so, um, um, I wanted it to be some version of my own. And uh, so it was a big, it was a big challenge in, in working on this book. Oh, I think you were successful, but I, I, I very successful, but I, I, I can't help but notice it came up in some conversations about you end with a Melville quote, which, you know, was stunning to me talking about just the last few sentences only in the heart of quickest perils only when within the edifying of his angry flukes, only on the profound and unbound sea can the fully invested whale be truly and livingly found out. I mean, that just, and that you ended it about, you know, at, uh, your phrase and as well, but as, as the survivors of the Essex came to know, once the end has been reached and all hope, passion and force of will have been expended, the bones may be all that's left. And I think that that to me was the perfect use of Melville and your voice coming together. It was a beautiful way to end well, it. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that's kind of why I left it. Uh, you know, that, that passage uh, was something that, you know, was, came late and, um, and for me was kind of cathartic. It was, uh, now I could uh, meet uh, Melville uh, mm. with, with the book, not behind me, uh, you know, still red hot in process, because editing is very important to me. I mean, that's when all a lot of the good stuff happens. But I, I really just needed to uh, have told the story uh, before you know I, you know, had the full blare of of his voice um, in my ears. And um, uh, so yeah, yeah, no, it's it was uh, an interesting. You know, it, it's Melville for me is 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 a voice. You know, I I, I say I try to. Uh, get out from his literary shadow, but I don't think I ever will. I mean, I don't think there's a book I've written which I don't at some point <laughs> refer uh, uh, either directly or at least I know I'm referring or st stealing uh, from uh, Moby Dick. Who else influences you? Who are other authors or, or writers? Yeah, that when writing? I was, yeah, I, you know, when I was young, uh, ha uh, Hawthorne uh, was big. Um, and then uh, I went through a William Faulkner jag um where i just read everything and you know and and that's really um when I, I think why i i jumped into history when i finally realized that was where i was going to go i you know hawthorne i mean um faulkner uh it's the past is as he says you know the, the past isn't past you know the it's it's as real as the present um uh and and um you know and that for me is fascinating whole concept of where we are now with the past you know it's done and gone but it's not it's with us all the time and so um and for me that it's it's using using a narrative to get at that past to sort of pry it open in a way uh that relates to where we are now uh with but without um uh changing the circumstances of that past you know it's you know because we we do have this tendency to sort of read our present through the past but i think it's important that the past be you we attempt to make the past as whole, as much as we can what it was and, you know it's impossible because we're always doing it from our own perspective but it's i think it's a it's something that needs to you need to at least try as hard as you can 
Are there contemporary authors that, that you find yourself drawn to now? You know, with each book I write, uh, I write, I read a ton of his, history books. Um, uh, that's, that's the world I live in. And so, you know, I, you know, David McCullough, mm -hmm. countless academic historians have been essential uh, to, to, you know, my ability to learn about the past, be directed to sources and, and these kinds of things. But, you know, I, when it comes to, you know, what authors I enjoy and all that, I, I read novels, <laughs> you know, I, I, because, you know, I was talking about the, the voice, um, that is what I need to nurture um, after a day of reading history, of, you know, delving into journals and newspapers. I, I, I feel like I need to fill up the well of, of um, my, sort of the literary side of things. And so, uh, you know, I read Dickens, I read, I tend to read, I'm now reading Anthony Trollope for the first time. Um, you know, not that he's at all like what I'm interested, in. Stephen King, I'm a huge fan of Stephen King. And, um, you know, that darkness, that, that sort of terror is, is you know, I kind of been a theme of mine, even when I'm writing about something like the revolution. Uh, but yeah, so it's, 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 I'm, I'm reading novels, Jack Reacher, you know, those kinds of things. Though that really is helpful to me, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, so that, that's what I read when I go to bed at night. And I don't know quite what it does, but, you know, in the morning, I don't know, I feel somehow that, that something subterranean in my soul <laughs> is is sort of living off that that I can then turn to the work of the day um, uh, with you know some some vestige of of a writerliness there uh, as I uh, jump into the the evidence and the, the historical method. It's interesting that that it doesn't surprise me that you read uh, fiction you know, as, as the palate cleanser, I guess, is the best way to put it. Right, right. Because one of the things that struck me with this book, um, and truly great nonfiction accounts, historical accounts, is there is almost a novelistic sense through it, something that grabs you as a reader. Um, and it, you know, I, we spoke about this, I think, a little bit before that, that the idea of how, you know, how the craft of what it takes to do something like that, to create something that doesn't read as another historical textbook on this is what happened, but that's compelling and keeps people, I mean, I had to shut the book a couple of times because, you know, the terror was there, Mr. King, um, you know, how, yeah. what, what, what advice would you give to a young writer who wants to take on something like that? How do right. you incorporate your voice into an historical account? Well, I think one of the things, one of the things I had to learn um, is that when you are do we're doing a work of history, you, the research is a huge part of it. 75% mm -hmm. of my time is research, um, which drives me crazy as a writer because it's the writing I really, really enjoy, but, um, I have to know as much about everything as I can before I can get to that point. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's taking notes, organizing those notes. And after you've spent three years, two years, three years researching something, you, you have a hard time um, letting that go. You know, you've put so much time and effort into it. But if you're going to write a compelling narrative, you have to be selective. You know, narrative nonfiction is not comprehensive. You're not trying to get everything in. You're trying to um, tell a story, um, you know, as as directly as you can, but don't say something in twelve sentences that can be said in five words. Um, and even though those twelve sentences would reveal that you had read this and all that, um, you know, and so you have to be heartless in in realizing yes the fact that you know that is important but you you don't need to tell people you know that and so it's it's that's where the voice comes in is trusting telling the story um and realizing that telling it as economically as po possible um uh uh involves leaving so much of it out um and that's really hard when you've spent so much time, you know, learning this stuff, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, 
one of the challenges of writing a book like this is that you've got um, you've got a plot. You know, you the, the the whale hits the ship, the men take to the lifeboats, the, those that survive get rescued. But there are elements of that plot where you don't have much evidence, and but you cannot make it up. And so that's where you see in the book I. I often look to parallel situations in mm -hmm. history, you know, where we don't know what happened to the Essex people, but we do know in a similar situation on board this vessel, this is what happens. And for me, that was really fun, um, um, knitting together these, these out of creating one narrative out of all of these historical threads. Um, and it's hard. And the other thing that, and this really surprised me actually, was how much the science I was learning would work into the narrative. I really, when I was thinking about beginning this book, I was thinking I'd stay, you know, the time frame would be the, the 19th century. But I found so much of what I was find, discovering about um, uh, the, the starvation experiments at the University of Minnesota, yeah. you know, all of those things. Wow, this real, if I can, you know, it really was fascinating to me. and. Uh, and I was finding at the dinner table, I was talking to my my wife and kids about it, and they were really interested in it. I thought, now can I, you know, there's juice there. There's narrative juice there. How can I get this into the narrative without violating the integrity of uh, this tale from the 19th century? And, and so I started sort of experimenting with that, and it worked. Um, it, I was beginning to realize that you know, a little bit of a sidebar there actually increased the drama as, you know, you learn stuff along the way, you were still, yeah, yes, but what's going to happen to them? And so um, it, that that was a surprise to me and um, and yet one that really made this feel unique and, and, and different for me in telling the story. Well, one that stuck out for sure was the, the account of the dehydrated gentleman in the desert. Yes. Um, I had never heard anything like that about dehydration. And I'm wondering if you, it, it, was that ever verified or if you read anything else, read anything else that that was incredible to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, no. I mean, it was, it was pretty much a sign. Yeah. The, you know, the bleeding eyeballs and all of that. I mean, it was clearly um, you could, it's perhaps a little sensationalized. But not much. I mean, and what struck me was how uh, how much of um, you know what are where I was reading you know what happened out in the desert, which is you know it's it's a much more concentrated version of dehydration than what they were experiencing. But ultimately, where the tongue thickens into a dead wooden object in your mouth, those kinds of things. Um, that was great. I mean, that was great. And once again, I, I would I would tell these stories to my 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 family at dinner. Uh, probably wasn't the most appropriate thing, but it was. They were on kind of my test audience, and um, uh, and and uh, so it sort of gave me the 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 courage to give it a try. Speaking of leaving out, I know editing is. Um not just the editing process, but that, you know, trying to find that, that storyline, that through line through it. Is there anything that you left out that you would wish you could go back or, uh, you know, explore or explain or add an addendum or, you know, yeah. part two? Well, you know, I, it was interesting because returning to the story um, uh, uh, with the big read and, and all of that. And, you know, and I read, you know, I wrote this more than 20 years ago and it is a it's from that time and you know and I I thought well what if I wrote that book now I I'd have the concerns we all have now you know now relative to then it would be a different story and you know uh and so you know one of the things going into this story um I I I felt was I needed to figure out as best I could what happened to the African-American sailors. It just, you know, this, this was back in 1998. Um, uh, Nantucketers, because of the Quaker abolitionist um, reputation of the island, had prided themselves when it came to, you know, racial injustice and all of that kind of thing. When it, you know, when it came to the issue of slavery. But as many people con uh, uh, commented on, and it's it's in Moby Dick too, is that these Quaker abolitionists, when it came to um, 
uh, owning a whale ship and managing a crew were, you know, or, or if they were, were, were by no means, you know, it was different um, when it came to, to the race. And, um, and so I really, and, you know, no African-American sailors survived this um, endeavor. And so why, what was going on there? Um, you know, was there any evidence of favoritism of, you know, racism there? Um, and, and I, so I looked at it as I, as directly as I could. Um, and, and so rereading it now was interesting. And, um, you know, it's frustrating because, right, I just feel, I just wish there was some account out there of, you know, perhaps the, uh, I was, I searched everywhere uh, for some account related to the, the African-American sailor who deserted in South America, you know, if he had any perspective on, you know, what was going to uh, unfold. And so I, I gave it my best shot in the book. And there, I have, I don't know, if I haven't learned of any new evidence um, uh, there, but um, it was one of those things that I felt where, you know, once again, this was a story, when I, when I approached this as a book, because I had written about the Essex as a chapter in my earlier work of, of history away offshore. When it came to it as a book, I really, what I wanted to do, I saw this as a way to tell the story, not as a Nantucket um, tale of whaling, but as a, a, a more universal tale of human nature under the, you know, the most uh, uh, tough circumstances. And so I, I really wanted this to, 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 you know, to resonate with all of the issues that America is, was struggling with in 1998, 2000, and is still today. Um, and, and so they're there, not that I could, you know, and I took it as far as I could. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think the story is provocative and uh, emblematic of, of, you know, the way it was at that point um, in Nantucket in American history. Is there um, any other, info I'm sure there is, but what kind of information or accounts of other African-American uh, whaling sailors experience during that same time? Yeah, yeah you know, and I, and I refer to some of them in the book, but you know, as, as um, you know, once again, it's rare when we have something from an African-American perspective mm -hmm. in yeah. terms of, of um, uh, narratives, journals, and and um, um, and those kinds of things, but there are plenty of evidence where you know the uh, I think it's quoted in in a way off in 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 the heart of the sea where the the um, Nantucketers are thought of as 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 uh, Negro drivers. I think is the term um, you know where you know here the you know they're they're Quaker abolitionists and yet when it comes to where their their economic bottom line. They're exploiting, um, you know. They're, it's just as exploitive as as any any um, institution in America, short of slavery. Yeah, you pulled this. There was a, a quote: um, "The Indians haven't disappeared. The Negroes are substituted in their place. Seamen of color are more submissive than the whites, but they are more addicted to frolicking. It is difficult to get them aboard the ship." when it is about to sail and to keep them aboard after it has arrived. The Negroes, though they are prized for their habits of obedience, are not as intelligent as the Indians and none of them attain the rank of boat steerer or mate. So, yeah, I- There you go. There are all the prejudices right there. And so yeah. I think, um, you know, there were Nantucketers um, who were kind of angry at me for, for sort of going there um, because of, you know, but I, 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 it's, it's my belief that unless we look um, the past warts and all um, as carefully and as closely as we can, this society will never get better. And so, um, you know, so I, you know, though it's painful uh, to, to quote those kinds of things, but it's, I think it's, it's important um, to, to, to get at what was actually going on um, and, and, and the assumptions uh, people had. Um, uh, and as they would play out uh, with with such terrible, um, you know, um, res results uh, on the Essex. 
Well, I was curious because, you know, your, your latest book travels with George. I was reading, I have not read the book. I'm looking forward to it, but it hasn't come out yet. Not yeah. Yet. Well, I'm looking it's forward to it. Number. Well, I saw it did, the, on your site. It was tagged as a 2020. So I was fingers crossed, but you know, George Washington had, you know, as we've gotten older in our, in our understanding as a country had a complicated to say the least relationship and under, uh, with, with race and with slavery. Did any of your experience working on, on this book or others in between inform how you looked at that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with, with travels with George, you know, this is um, my wife and I and our dog, Dora, uh, you know, the title is, a conscious borrowing of Stein, John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie. And we follow, when George Washington became president, uh, he realized he was a leader of essentially 13 independent states. He had to do something to create a sense of national unity. You know, he had to bring the country together. Some things never change. <laughs> and, um, and so he went on a series of road trips. He visited all 13 states. And so Melissa, myself, and Dora followed uh, Washington. And uh, if the book is as much about our journey as it is Washington's. And one of the things I wanted to do was, you know, we were doing this at a time when Confederate statues were being taken down. All of this was happening and we were following a slaveholder. Um, and so uh, it felt to, for me, this was a reckoning, uh, not only, you know, uh, with Washington, uh, with the beginnings of this country and, um, and, Washington is just fascinating in terms of how he personally wrestled with the issue. And I'm not going to go into it because you got to read the book before. Um, but um, but it, that is an essential theme and per perhaps the essential theme of the book, um, uh, particularly as we followed Washington from New England into the South as far um, as, as uh, Savannah, Georgia. Well, looking forward to that. We have, um, this sounds like a good time to maybe segue a little bit. We have some questions that were Great. submitted from um, all over the country, quite literally. We, uh, for people that are watching, we had uh, a partnership with Middletown Public Library who's also chosen this book as uh, part of the big read. And one of the you know positive things that came out of the pandemic was an opportunity for us to do some, some things together. So they sent some questions and then we have some questions from students here. Um, at Wallowa and Enterprise School. So if you are willing, I've got some- I'm ready, hit me. That's some good ones. So let's have some fun. Uh, the first one, I love this question. Um, oh, we already asked that question. Here's one. He says, uh, why, if you could ask one question to Thomas Nickerson, what would it be? And that's from Tyler Knapp, who is an eighth grader at Enterprise. Oh, wow. That is a very good question. Isn't that great? Yeah. And, and you know, Thomas Nickerson for me, um, yes, there's what goes on between Pollard and Chase, but it was Thomas Nickerson's perspective that was my way into the material. Um, you know, his, his journal had been fairly recently discovered uh, and, you know, it's, it's different from Chase's narrative and in all sorts of ways that reveal things that Chase chose not to disclose. And what if, man, if I was, you know, and late in life, Nickerson, you know, was proprietor of a guest house. So let's say I arrived on Nantucket on a, you know, cold, windy uh, winter's day and, and, and uh, went to Thomas Nickerson's guest house and let's see, had some grog with him. What would we talk about? Oh, man. I, you know, I, 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 in his narrative, he denies the fact that they ate human flesh even though Chase says they did. You know, he was an older man who didn't want to be remembered as a cannibal. But I, what I would like to ask him is what really happened on those whale boats? You know, why, 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 why did no African-American make it out alive? What was going on? Um, why was it only Nantucketers that emerged from those whale boats um, um, in one you know, alive, what was going on, and just hear him try to explain it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, he, he is someone that I had great sympathy for. Can you imagine, you know, being 14, actually he had just turned 15 because he had his birthday, and he was holding the, the, the wheel of the Essex when it was struck by the whale. I mean, 
Can you imagine that? I mean, so I just would have wanted to, 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 you know, I don't think I could limit it to one question. I think, you know, it would just be, he is the one of all of them who I'd like to talk to because, you know, he was not an officer trying to put a very bad vo voyage in the best possible light. And, you know, he was someone who was a young, impressionable kid, and it would be really interesting to hear his take on things. Well, let's see. Uh, Cindy from Hackensack, New Jersey. Uh, she said, this book is about the Essex and the men who survived and died in that event. That being said, did you do any research into the wives and families of these men who had to survive on the island for a year or more while the men were out at sea? I know you talked a little bit about it in the book, but it had, was, was there any additional research into what their lives were like? Yeah, and, you know, this was, it's the frustrations of writing about um, a whaling voyages because, I mean, I, I wanted to get so much more of Nantucket in there because, um, you know, Nantucket was such a unique community. I mean, it was basically in many ways run by the women uh, because so many of the men were gone. And, you know, they were making major economic decisions. They were holding the families together. You know, we complain today about how, um, you know, our lives are divided between work and family. Can you imagine, you know, where your whole society half, you know, the, the, the men are away for years at a time and then back for a few months and then out again. And so, you know, a society had emerged that sustained this. And so, I, you know, but I realized I really only had um, the first chapter and then the last chapter, the consequences to bring in what was going on there. Um, uh, and so I did a lot of research into a genealogical research and you know, into what relationships they had with their wives and children and all that kind of thing. And uh, you know, where uh, you know, it's, it Chase, Chase has the most interesting one, right? Where he has you know, a, a wife who um, bears him a child, <laughs> Uh, more than nine months after he left Nantucket, uh, which is pretty interesting, uh, you know. And once again, you know, these were people, human beings. You know, they were not stere rigid, stereo, you know, typical Quaker, you know, pioneering seafarers. These were people um, with urges, uh, with fears, um, uh, uh, that were trying to deal with a really weird society when you look at it and um, and doing the best they could. And so I, you know, it's in there as much as I could get uh, as far as the both sides of it, but inherent, sort of like Moby Dick, inherently material lends itself um, to, to make it kind of frustrating that I couldn't put more of the other side of the story in there. Well, thank you. There's some questions here about the whales themselves. So let's talk about that. Um, well, here's a question submitted from Nick, who is a student at Red Bank Catholic High School in New Jersey, Red Bank, New Jersey. He, uh, he asked, why do you think the whale was so aggressive on its attack on the Essex? Good question. Well, listen, it was one of those things, um, it would have been great to, to find a descendant of one of the whales <laughs> and interview him, you know, what was your granddaddy thinking? But of course that wasn't going to happen. And so I, you know, I did a lot of research and to cetology, uh, you know, the science of whales. And, um, and, and one of the really great authorities um, uh, is, a, is a scientist named Hal Whitehead, who uh, actually he and his wife, and I refer to him, uh, uh, his, his, his work in the book, but he and his wife and his kids went out on a sailboat equipped with a very, you know, the highest end technology of, of listening devices and sailed in the waters pretty much plied by the Essex listening to whale conversations. And, you know, he did some of the pioneering research into how they communicated with a series of clicks and clacks and all that kind of thing. And, and, um, and so, because I, I had the exact same question, what was the whale thinking? <laughs> you know, what was going on, you know, and it seems, you know, the fact that the whale runs into the ship once, uh, which seemed almost accidental, um, but hits it pretty hard on the side, comes up on the other side of the ship, knocked out, 
uh, Chase has the option of, of potentially trying to kill the whale, but doesn't for fear that its tail will take out the rudder. And then the whale springs to life and is obviously a very angry sperm whale that um, then attacks the ship. And, and, you know, what was this behavior? So I asked Hal Whitehead in an in a email, you know, what was going on? He said, you know, there's no way to know for certain. He, he, he was, you know, he was thinking it may have been uh, an accident. You know, he had never seen behavior in which, a, you know, a whale aggressively attacked a vessel. But, that, you know, there's all sorts of historic evidence of whales doing that. And so, um, uh, you know, my, one of my th theories that I posit there, this is a bull sperm whale. Um, and bull sperm whales like elephants uh, fight with other males over females and that kind of thing. Is, is that what's going on? Did it think this ship where Chase was na uh, repairing a whaleboat when this whale attacked? And the, the, the way whales communicate is with a series of clicks and clacks. It sounds so much like the tapping of a hammer that um, the, the, the whales were, sperm whales were known as the carpenter fish among whalemen. Where, you know, was, was Chase um, uh, unwittingly sending out a, a message of challenge to this whale? Who knows? Ultimately, we don't know. But that was one of the challenges of writing that scene. I wanted to layer in all of these possibilities without uh, being definitive because well, there's no way of knowing. And, um, but it's, it's, you know, that's what I kind of like about the story. There is ultimately some, an unknown in the middle of it. Um, you will never know exactly what happened. I'll, you know, uh, we'll never know what that whale was thinking. Our uh, kickoff for this Dig Read event this year um, featured a, a, a marine biologist from Hatfield Marine Center in Newport, Oregon, and she she said, "No, this happens, and it still happens. That it's not uh, it's not unheard of for sperm whales to attack boats." So she said it was actually not as unheard of as people would think. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. Um, yeah. You know, because and you know, and one of the things is this was a really big whale. Uh, this was an you know, eight, 85 foot sperm whale, and you just don't see them that big anymore. And, um, and, but at the Nantucket Whaling Museum, we have a jaw of a whale of that size. It was so big that uh, P.T. Barnum wanted to purchase it so he could um, exhibit it, you know, in, in his museum. And uh, the Nantucketers didn't sell, thank God. But, um, you know, this was a huge creature. So we have a question from Tylee Evans, who's an enterprise junior high seventh grader who wanted to know, what would you have done if you were on the Essex? In hindsight, is there anything the sailors could have done to prevent that attack? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I, I don't know what they, you know, first off, um, I know if I was, had been in those whale boats, I would not have been a hero by any means. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I love to sail. I love the sea, but um, I, I don't think I would want to be under those circumstances. So, you know, just because I write about this stuff does not mean I am a person, I have, I have any personal bravery at all. You know, it's hindsight. Um, I think Chase was about as, you know, experienced a whaleman as you're going to get. Um, as, as Nickerson would say, if Chase knew what was going to happen, he would have thrown the killing lance and tried to kill that whale uh, as it lay, lay knocked out beside them. He would have risked the rudder. But that's, that's hindsight, of course. Um, you know, I don't know what they could have done, um, the, the, given the size of the whale. One of the interesting things is when I was researching this story, I had a, a friend who is a um, naval architect. And my question was, you know, if the Essex had been a new vessel, if she had been in perfect repair, would she have been stove in in the bow the way she was? And so he did an analysis. It was really interesting where we figured out how big a, you know, what was the velocity of the whale, its weight, how big a, you know, what, how big would have been the impact have been, what would have the forces? And he determined if it had been a new whale ship, uh, it would not have crushed the bow. Uh, that the Essex was an old ship, 
there was clearly um, this owners, it was not in the greatest of shape. And so that contributed to, to the disaster. Um, but, you know, so once again, I think it's, it's one of these combinations of, 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 of factors that led to <laughs> this extraordinary event. I mean, you know, and it's just, luckily the ship didn't sink uh, immediately and it enabled the men to, to then salvage what they could for the, their uh, voyage across the ocean in those little whale boats. I, I couldn't help but thinking in my, you know, as I was reading that account of Pollard, who's out miles away and then comes back and finds his boat. I, I had this vision of, I wrecked my dad's car when I went to visit him one time and I took him out to the garage. It's like, you know, dad, <laughs> what happened? You know, he's, what happened to my car? And I keep thinking what was going through his head when he oh. came back and saw his ship. I, you know, well, I think one of the great, yes. The, one of the great exchanges is, you know, can you imagine here you are first time captain, yeah. the voyage hasn't been going particularly well. And then <laughs> the, your, your ship disappears uh, behind the horizon. You row back and there it is lying there. And what does Pollard say? My God, Mr. Chase, what is the matter? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a um, man of few words. And what does uh, Chase say? We have been stove by a whale. And I mean, man, that, that kind of says it all. But um, can you imagine the emotions in, you know, behind no. the words. Uh, so I think we'll wrap this up with a question about the film. Yvonne from Staten Island, New York, wants to know how involved you were with the production of the film based on the book. Yeah, oh, well, good question. I mean, it was interesting. This, um, the, the book was optioned soon after it was published. Uh, and then, uh, and Brian, it almost seemed to see, and I was, you know, new to all this and immediately assumed, oh, it's going to become a movie. But 13 years later, it hadn't become a movie. And um, so I had sort of given up, you know, assumed it never would be. And then someone sent me something from the internet saying the actor Chris Hemsworth had attached himself to the script and um, attached him. What does that mean? Well, and, um, and then it, it, it came true that then uh, Ron Howard, with whom uh, uh, Hemsworth had worked on a previous film, was going to direct it. And suddenly it looked like this was actually going to become a film. And so uh, I, I was still a little skeptical because, uh, you know, this is a hard, hard kind of subject matter to put on the screen. And, uh, and then one of the more cool lunches I've ever had was at Mystic Seaport uh, in Mystic, Connecticut, uh, which is a um, maritime museum that has the last remaining wooden whale ship, the Charles W. Morgan. Uh, it's bigger than the Essex would have been, but it's a wooden whale ship. And it had been very important to my research. I had spent a lot of time there, um, you know, sort of visualizing what was going to happen. But the ship was being um, uh, re restored and it was up on dry dock, but they arranged that uh, I had lunch uh, with uh, uh, Ron Howard and Peter Morgan, uh, the screenwriter who was sort of uh, rewriting the script a bit. He's the one behind The Crown and The Queen, you know, a British uh, screenwriter. And we had uh, lunch together in the captain's cabin of the Charles W. Morgan, discussing how In the Heart of the Sea was going to become a movie. And yeah, that was really, really cool. And um, as Peter Morgan said, you're gonna hate me by the end of this, what I do to your book, this is what happens. And I said, no, whatever, it's gonna be a movie. It's a, and what I began to realize, it's just an entirely different, it's a collaborative process. Um, you have to go with the story. You can't go down all those various avenues I was able to do in the book. And then um, they, uh, it was filmed uh, in England, outside London at the same uh, uh, studio where Harry Potter was filmed. Uh, they created, uh, actually, uh, there's CGI in it, but they actually created a Nantucket waterfront uh, where they had a huge water tank about the size of two football fields, uh, chest high water with a, a wharf going out. Uh, they even glued uh, seaweed to it to make it look real. And they had an 85, a life-size 85 foot Essex tied up to it. And, um, and before Ron Howard would, um, you know, 
say action, he would cue the waves and the guy in the corner would get the wave machine going so that the water was moving. And uh, so uh, we're, uh, we were invited onto the set and, um, and Ron said, uh, would you like to be in the film? Would you like to be a Quaker? And I said, yeah, I'd love to be in the film. My wife decided she'd much rather just watch Chris Hemsworth uh, than be a Quaker. <laughs> but, um, and so uh, I am in, in the movie, In the Heart of the Sea. If you blink, you'll miss me. But there's a quick scene uh, as the men are being rowed out to the Essex. There's a group of Quakers on the waterfront reading a poem that's actually um, uh, referred to in the first chapter of In the Heart of the Sea by one Pillock Folger, a Nantucket Quaker, about the mightiness of the whale. And so I am there. Uh, they, I had my own trailer. It was a very small trailer, but um, and I, I had uh, I was given hair for the first time in 20 years. They put a shoulder length wig on me. I looked like my mother and uh, they dressed me up as a Quaker. And so I'm in the front line uh, looking very uh, aggrieved. I'm not sure what I'm not an actor, but it was a fascinating process. And uh, and I have to say, you know, the movie is its own thing. Uh, but the, as a sailor, and I've talked to other sailors who have seen the movie, I don't know if there's a movie that does a better job of recreating what it feels like at sea. The, the scene when the Essex is knocked over uh, in, in the, 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 the thunderstorm is, is amazing. Uh, the, the footage of, of the whale boats attacking the whales is, is the best you know, it's it's horrifying, but it's 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 extremely realistic, and so um, it was a great experience, and um, and uh, you know, I, it, to to work with Ron Howard and everyone associated with the film, and and you know, and hey, uh, Thomas Nickerson, the actor, um, Tom Holland is now Spider Man. So there you so go. There you go. Yeah. So do you have one time for one more quick question? Sure. Uh, we have a student who's a seventh grader in Malawi who wants to know how many times you've read Moby Dick. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have read it at least 12 times. Wow. Uh, 12 times. And, but also I, um, it's, as I said earlier, it's my personal Bible. And so I, I have a couple of copy of, of it behind me. And every now and then I will just pick it up and open it up randomly and read uh, a page. It's it's one of the it's like the Bible uh, in that um, each page is nurturing to me. When I'm on book tour, if ever I am on book tour again, and I'm uh, waiting for an airplane that's been delayed and getting totally stressed out, I even have Moby Dick on my phone. Um, and I and for me, it's kind of like worry beads. It's uh, you know, it's it's it gets me through the day, and uh, so. You know, I've read it through 12 times, but uh, I've read it randomly countless times. And, um, and kids, a word of advice. Um, I, think Mo I think Moby Dick is a book to read once you've had some life experience. Melville was 31 when he wrote Moby Dick. I, I don't think I really got as much out of it as I could until I was in my 30s. That doesn't mean you should re read the beginning chapter, you know, call me Ishmael. It's terrific, but it's a tough book. Um, uh, but all I can say is as you get older, it becomes more and more amazing. And what I have found every time I return to Moby Dick, it's as if it's a different book. The book hasn't changed, I've changed. And it is so well written. It's tapped into the universal experience of life in such an essential way that when I return to it, it's it's different. It's it's just amazing. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just because you, you, you know it's you, it puts you off in the beginning. Return to it later in life because it's the gift that keeps on giving. Well, Nat, thank you so much. And I know um, all of our watchers and, and readers and big readers are grateful that you took the time out to talk about a work that you put away 20 years ago and keeps coming back and keeps giving you gifts. I hope that when this is uh, these times have changed again and you're on book tour, if you ever make it out to the West Coast, you come by and see us. Oh, and, I would love to. Uh, yeah, we are just very grateful. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, and and it, like I said, this has been such a unique your partnership uh, 
with Middletown is is been so exciting to me, and um, it's it um, it's just such a thrill to to get and the and thank talking with you was to, I think we could have gone on for several hours, uh, but the questions were great and um, and it's questions from young readers that keep me going. So so thanks very much. This has just been really fun for me. Thanks for watching Fish Traps NEA Big Read finale with us. Even though this is our last event of the year, that doesn't mean it has to be the end of the Big Read for you. Go to fishtrap.org and discover all of the special events from the past month online, as well as a host of extra resources, including online museum exhibits, presentations, and a whole bunch more. Plus, we invite you to continue the Big Read journey by joining Middletown Public Library, who are just starting their Big Read programming with another month of special events and resources. You can find links to all of this at fishtrap.org. Thanks again for watching and happy reading.